Starbucks is an American company that is the largest coffee house chain and one of the most recognizable brands in the world, with over 32,000 stores in 80 countries. Its headquarters are in Seattle, Washington. Starbucks brand ranked 51st in the world according to Interbrands, and it has cemented its position as the world's most valuable restaurant brand, with a brand value of $53.4 billion. Discover the history of Starbucks and how it became the global giant it is today. The Early Years Starbucks was founded by Jerry Baldwin, Gordon Boca, and Zev Sigo, opening its first store in 1971 near the historic Park Place Market in Seattle. The three Starbucks founders had two things in common. They were all coming from academia. They all loved coffee and tea. They invested and borrowed some money to open the first store in Seattle and named it Starbucks. After the first mate, Starbucks, in Herman Melville's classic novel, Moby Dick, Alfred Pitt, a coffee roasting entrepreneur, was a major inspiration to the founders of Starbucks. Pitt was a Dutch immigrant who had begun importing fine Arabica coffees into the United States during the 1950s. In 1966, he opened a small store, Pitt's Coffee and Tea, in Berkeley, California, that specialized in importing first-rate coffees and teas. Pitt's success encouraged the Starbucks founders to base their business model on selling high-quality coffee beans and equipment, and Pitt's became the initial supplier of green coffee beans to Starbucks. The partners then purchased a used roaster from Holland, and Baldwin and Boca experimented with Alfred Pitt's roasting techniques to create their own blends and flavors. By the early 1980s, Starbucks had opened four stores in Seattle that stood out from the competitors with their top quality fresh roasted coffees. In 1980, Sego decided to pursue other interests and left the two remaining partners, with Baldwin assuming the role of company president. The Howard Schott era. In 1981, Howard Schott, a sales representative from Hammerplast, a Swedish company that made kitchen equipment and housewares from which Starbucks bought drip coffee makers, noticed how large the company's orders were, which prompted him to pay it a visit. Short was so impressed that he decided to pursue a career at Starbucks, and he was hired as the head of marketing in 1982. Short noticed that first-time customers sometimes felt uneasy in the stores because of their lack of knowledge about fine coffees, so he worked with store employees on developing customer-friendly sales skills and produced brochures that made it easy for customers to learn about the company's products. Short's biggest idea for the future of Starbucks came during the spring of 1983 when the company sent him to Milan to attend an international housewares show. While in Italy, he was so impressed with the country's cafes and discovered that Milan alone boasted 1,500 coffee houses. Inspired, he thought of doing something similar in Starbucks and envisaged turning a tiny regional operation into a national coffee house chain via rapid store expansion. However, Baldwin and Boca were not enthusiastic about Short's idea as they did not want Starbucks to deviate from its traditional model of business. They wanted Starbucks to remain strictly a coffee and equipment seller and not turn into a cafe that served espressos and cappuccinos. Seeing that he would not be able to persuade Baldwin and Boca to embrace the cafe idea, Shots left Starbucks in 1985 and started his own coffee chain called Giona, which was an immediate success, quickly expanding into multiple cities. In March 1987, Baldwin and Boca decided to sell Starbucks and Short was quick to use Giona to purchase the company with investor backing. He combined all his operations under the Starbucks brand and committed to the cafe concept for the business, with additional sales of beans, equipment and other items in Starbucks stores. Under Short's guidance, in four years, the coffee house chain grew from fewer than 20 stores to more than 100. Starbucks entered into a meteoric period of expansion that continued after the company went public in 1992. In 1996, it began opening stores outside North America, and Starbucks soon became the largest coffee house chain in the world. By the end of the decade, Starbucks had some 2,500 locations in about a dozen countries. Schultz announced in 2000 that he was stepping down as CEO but would remain as chairman. 
By 2007, the chain boasted more than 15,000 locations worldwide, but was foundering. And in January 2008, Schultz returned as CEO. He oversaw the closure of 900 stores and implemented an ambitious strategy to secure new venues of growth, which included acquisitions of a bakery chain and the makers of a coffee brewing system, as well as the introduction of an instant coffee brand. He also oversaw changes of many offerings at Starbucks stores. Starbucks had begun selling food in its cafes in 2003. These moves were largely successful and by 2012, Starbucks had rebounded financially. Schultz again stepped down as CEO and was replaced as CEO by Kelvin Johnson in 2017. Schultz continued to be active in the company, serving as executive chairman until 2018 when he was replaced by Maron Ullman. The world's largest Starbucks, a Starbucks reserve roastery, opened in Chicago in 2019. In 2021, one, Starbucks had a presence in dozens of countries around the globe and operated over 32,000 stores. During this time, however, Starbucks was also facing various challenges. Notably, workers at several of its stores began to unionize, despite opposition from the company. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic and related supply chain issue had a negative impact on sales, especially in China, one of the company's key markets. In 2022, Johnson abruptly departed and shot to return as interim CEO. Later that year, Starbucks announced that it had hired Laxman Narasiman to replace Shots in 2023. Sustainability and Community Development Starbucks seeks to support the farming community it works with through a number of non-governmental organizations with programs designed to strengthen economic and social development. The company also offers farmers loans and in 2019, it made relief payments to its farmers in Guatemala. Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Mexico when coffee prices hit record lows. In addition, by 2021, the company had 10 farmer support centers and shared open source agronomy practices with growers in coffee producing countries around the world. The program had trained more than 200,000 farmers since the first center opened in Costa Rica in 2004. Starbucks is often cited as an industrial leader in paying above market rates for its coffee beans. Though these higher rates are usually paid to a broker and may or may not translate to higher profits for the farmers themselves. The company states that more than 99% of its beans are ethically sourced and has a commitment to reach 100%. It also aims to have 100% of its tea and coffee ethically sourced. To this end, it employs its own set of economic and agricultural standards known as coffee and farmer equity CAFE practices and acts in partnership with Conservation International to foster environmental sustainability. The company is also one of the largest purchasers of fair trade certified coffee in the world and a number of its blend are certified organic. Despite its apparent commitment to buying ethically sourced coffee, Starbucks also faced allegations of purchasing from farms and plantations that use child labor and slave labor or that has workers in unsanitary conditions. In 2018 and 2019, two Starbucks CAFE plant in Brazil were found to have slave-like conditions and an investigation in 2020 found children under the age of 13 were working on five Guatemalan farms that supply Starbucks. Critics of CAFE practices claim that the required farm inspections are too infrequent to protect farm workers as inspections can happen as infrequently as every two to three years depending on factors such as the farm's previous inspection scores. In addition, unlike the fair trade certified coffee, Starbucks CAFE practices do not have a minimum guaranteed price for farmers. Farms are not required to be small scale and community development is not democratically administered by the farmers themselves. These facts have been used to argue that the CAFE practices are more to satisfy consumer consciences than to actually benefit coffee producers and alleviate poverty. Hi, thanks for watching to the end. I hope this video has been informative and entertaining. If you like this video and you would like to see more content Contents like this, kindly like, share, leave a comment in the comment section, and also please subscribe to this channel if you have not already subscribed yet. Thanks for watching to the end. Have a nice day and look out for the next video.